Hello, welcome to Bulldogs Unleashed, our latest edition brought to you by Reclaim the Game and a very special episode of Bulldogs Unleashed with three guys who really know what it's like to win a premiership with the Bulldogs, but they've also been through some pretty tough times as well. Well, two of them have, and we'll get on to Corey Payne's career management in just a minute. Corey Payne, Roy Asatazi and Dean Hallettow, welcome back to the show, boys. Good to be here, Bill. Uh, we'll be talking about the relationship that these guys have with the dogs and also in the context of what they did at other clubs as well because all three went to other clubs and did very well there and played significant roles there. So we'll compare that. We'll also be talking about the hardship that they faced at various times in their careers and how it relates to what the team's going through here at the moment. And, of course, in dog days, we'll have a close look at some of their best moments, the players they played with and remember very fondly. And also, we'll compare two very significant eras for the Bulldogs, the 2004 team and the 2012 team. Quite different in the way they played, their makeup, but very successful in their own right. And these three guys can tell a lot about that. This week's headlines. First of all, though, let's have a look at how things are travelling at the moment. And obviously, not particularly well for this club. But they, let's put some context on it, boys. I mean... This season, I know we've got a very close competition in terms of points on the ladder and the makeup of the eight and who might even be in the grand final is anyone's guess at this stage, although there are some standouts at the moment. But for the fourth time in NRL history, two teams have scored more than 60 points in a single round. So that's not many, many times that's happened. The other interesting thing is the Cowboys' 74-point margin creates a 122-point turnaround on their earlier loss to the Tigers. So between the two teams, a 122-point differential from one round to another within a season, and that is a record in the NRL. This is the type of weirdness we're facing in 2023. How about this? The Sharks, we all know how inconsistent they've been, although they look a million dollars when they're on. They conceded 54 points the week before they put 48 on the Bulldogs. So there's a lot of weird stuff going on. In that context, to, to lose a game 66-0, well, time will tell, I suppose. But I want to ask you guys firstly, and I'll start with a quote from Gus Gould on social media this week. He said, Today was not good, quite upsetting for a number of our younger players, actually. Right now we need to look after them. That's our first job. So I'll have a whip round the table, and we are dealing with a young team here. So, Corey, firstly... Um, We'll, we'll talk later about how you career managed to be in three very successful teams in three very successful clubs. But firstly, your thoughts on, on, on how tough it is in a situation like that. Have you actually had a loss like that and how did you deal with it? Oh, fortunately, I never had a 66-0 or a 74-0 <laughs> um, loss in, in, in the NRL um, era. But I, I think it's, it's going to be very tough. Um, they've got a very young team. They've got a very inexperienced team. They've got a number of experienced players who, who have – been out injured, um, you know, the, the the young guys have been through a bit of a rough tranche over the last probably six weeks. I've had a few probably, you know, big losses. Um, Cronulla, 48 points, and then mm. I, I think the Roosters put some points on them as well. But I don't think anyone turned up on, on Sunday thinking, you know, that, that was going to be the scoreline. And for all intensive purposes, no one runs out on the field thinking – Mm. It's going to be that that sort of uh, scoreline, and I wouldn't have thought anyone would have thought Newcastle was in that position to to do that, right? But uh, unfortunately, that's what's happened, um, and that's you know part and parcel of the game. And the the good thing is, there's always another game, as always next week, and they've got another game to front up. And I, I think to Gus's point, you know, the the number one thing is you've got to look after the young players, and every club goes through this uh, in the modern era, so to speak, of a rebuild where they've got. You know, to work their way back up the top, and you know, you, you got to bring young players through. And part of bringing young players through, you need to surround them with experience as well to build that confidence. And you know, hopefully, the young guys don't have all the confidence knocked out of them. You know, by, by being beat consistently from large score lines because they've got enough experienced blokes around them. But at the moment, there's you know a couple of really important players for the dogs that have been out, and um, I think you know it's all sort of just all sort of caught up with them um, mm. on Sunday. So. It's a you know it, it, it's an unfortunate outcome, but it's not something that they they would have gone out there thinking was possible. And I'm sure they're working very hard this week to to get back on the horse. A lot of that experience that Corey talks about is actually not on the field at the moment. It's in the dressing room. How does that help, Roy? And and, and people like you too are uh, plugged into the team. What do you do? Yeah, I guess it's um, you know there's a lot of things that have been going on with the dog over the last twelve months. You know the transition period. 
new coaches, new playing start, uh, new players. Um, that's one element of it. And then you also got to try and make sure that they all gel well together. And um, dogs haven't had a great start to the season. Injuries, a lot of players, main players that they were expecting to play throughout the season, and, and it's kind of been stop start. So you had some players come in and out of the squad, and um, but it's you know it's. I can understand where Gus is coming with that quote because at the end of the day, you got to focus on the core of your players because that's the only people that can change it. Is mm. the people yeah. Dressing shit. So no one else. If you can go and listen out to what's out there in the media, and I think that's players are professional enough to stay away from the media, um, and the only people that can fix it is themselves. So how they t- turn up in the next game is going to exactly show what kind of character the Bulldogs mm. are. And uh, like I said, there's a lot of young players in the team. Um, it would have been, you know, they would have felt like they just had their pants pulled down last weekend. Uh, it's up to the leaders of the group to be able to, you know, set the benchmark now. And obviously that is 66-0 was the score. That's it. That's it. You've got to move forward. Concentrate on who your next game is this week. Uh, that's all you can control right now. Mm. Wayne Bennett famously said after a, a rare Brisbane big loss, I think that it's still only two points in the competition ladder, which is a, a nice way of putting it if you if you want to get people back yeah. on board. Uh, any recollections of a loss like that, Dino? What did you do? Yeah, I've, I've unfortunately been on the receiving end of a, of a couple of losses by uh, 50 to 60 points. Uh, I remember one actually up in, in Townsville when I, in my last few years of playing um, up there in Townsville in 2015, I think it was, or 16, and um, they, they tore us apart and there's no worse feeling when you go in at half time and there's already 30 points on the board and mm. you're looking around at each other wondering where the answer is going to come from it's, it's it's not a great feeling and um, to, to the point the boys made before like no one goes out there expecting to play like that no one wants to go out and play like that unfortunately sometimes uh, you, you miss the kick and the other team finds a bit of uh, momentum and then it just carries on from there and, and you get too far behind so um it's an awkward feeling. It's an ugly feeling. And the one thing that I probably can add is that the longer you stay in that moment, the worse it's going to be. So you've you got to really put it to bed and move on. Teams teams do turn around. You look at the, the Cowboys, use that example mm. in their turnaround with the Tigers. They were embarrassed at Leichhardt over with a – they've got a quality side and mm. they've got some rep players playing for them. So it's, it's often easy to come back when you know you've got, you got that artillery. But um, it, it can turn around and, and they're a perfect example of that. So getting around those younger players like – Gus mentioned a lot the boys have just said uh, and, and really honing in on what is important to the group and, and working on the things that you can do to get out of it. Uh, in the many years I've hosted shows like this on TV and we've ever brought up crowds booing, uh, we get slammed by the fans who insist on the right to boo. Not all of us do it. Uh, I certainly have never done it, but um, others think it's their right to do it because they're members or they pay their money to watch the game and, and that's okay. It's part of sport. But as a player... We won't tell the fans what to do, but what is it like? Uh, have you ever experienced it? Yeah, experienced the booze. I mentioned a couple of the losses, uh, the big losses that we've had, and uh, it's it, again, it's not a great feeling when you when you booed walking off at halftime. Halftime booze, you still got forty minutes to play, yeah. and it's motivation for some. Like how many to, of those did you have? Uh, <laughs> there was, I half-time remember. Booze. I remember <laughs> were, were you the first off the field? Or? <laughs> I remember one at Campbelltown actually, and <laughs> <laughs> we deserve to be booed out. Right? Yeah, <laughs> but the. Um, the thing is, like, I, I don't mind booze for a team performance. I, I, I don't mm. like it when it's directed at individual players. Like like yeah. I said before, yep. players don't go out there to try and play bad because you, you ride so much on the performance yourself. You mm. put a lot of pressure on yourself and um, especially young players that mistakes are going to happen. And when you're in quicksand as a group, it can be, you know, made worse, made look made to look worse when individuals make 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 errors. And um, it, it's funny when, team, when some fullbacks or outside backs – Continually drop the ball and they catch one and you get the Bronx cheer. Everyone goes, up, hey, he's caught one. You know, it's the reverse of it, I guess, like a, a cheer for the mistake that didn't happen. Um, so I, I just don't like when it hones in on, on individuals. Mm. But, I, but I definitely understand it when uh, a team's underperformed. Uh, all great athletes have said at some stage or another that losing builds character. And I think most of us agree with that to some degree. But uh, losing a lot and badly uh, can start to erode confidence too. So... What are the little things you look for to find wins? Uh, if things are, are in that phase where you know you're not going to have a certain amount of success for a certain amount of time, but you can see the, the light at the end of the tunnel, but in the short term, what do you do? What are the little percentage things that you try and just chip away at? Rock, what do you think? Yeah, look, um, the easiest concept for us as players is to go out there and worry about the one percenters. Yep. That's making your tackles. 
uh, doing the little things off the ball, off your efforts. That's what coaches look at. Uh, uh, fans aren't going to see that kind of – aren't going to see mm. that. They're going to just see what – they expect tries, they expect big hits, big tackles. But as a team, you've got to work together. You, every team's got their um, KPIs. they got to make sure that they're hitting those KPIs every week. If they're hitting that in this next game, whether it's making all your tackles – uh, completing all your sets, getting to the other end. Because then you put yourself in a good situation to to win a game. Uh, to perform. To perform. Mm. But if you're not doing those um, little KPIs, which, you know, and if you're not doing it, uh, the, the sad part about it is that people on the outside can see it. You know, you get your fans, they can see yeah. the effort that you're putting in and you're not putting it in. And if, if they show that same kind of performance again this week, you know, you can kind of almost say, yeah, they deserve it. But... Mm. Um, but at the same time, players can, the team can change the mindset, the mind, their mindset and attitude as they go into this next game. So it's just, the, I think when it comes down as players, it was just an attitude thing. Um, just, you know, a lot of people are going to say, well, the, the attitude should be always on every week. But some days you don't go out there to try and play. It's that. a young, young team as yeah. well, right? That's a, that's a big challenge yeah. at the moment. And if anyone's going to be in a position to help Canary get through this, it's it's Gus, right? Yeah. Like he's been there and done it. He, he did it at... At the uh, at the Panthers, but if I think about the the challenge here and like very much echoing what Roy's saying, in the sense of <clears throat> you know I think about my career in, in, in playing under Tim Sheens at the West Tigers, and I'm sure t- uh, Hello, you can attest to this. Sheens used to say there's a, there's a difference between a, a full time NRL player and this professional player, right? The full timer he turns up and mm. you know he trains and plays and his performance is up and then it's down, it's up, it's up and it's down, it's down, it's up. It's it's not consistent. Whereas the professional understands every week what they need to do to perform, um, mm. you know, in, in terms of hydration, sleep, extras, you know, all the little bits and pieces, reviewing your game and all those sort of things. They're the KPIs. I'm, um, yeah, I, I think Roy's Roy's you know, referring to and. You know, in the world of business, Amazon, we make it much more simpler. We just say the inputs drive the outputs, right? Yeah. So the outputs is win-loss, but what are the inputs that drive it? What are the inputs you need to own? What are the inputs that you need to deliver on week in, week out, day in, day out, with the discipline to drive the right outputs, the KPIs, the preparation piece? And I think if, you know, if I was in a position of being beat 64, 66 nil, 74-0 or whatever these score lines were, I'd, I'd be going back to my preparation – and making sure that everything I do in the lead up to this week's game, I tick every box and mm. do it to the best of my ability. And then come game day, the attitude piece, am I going to dive on that loose ball? Am I going to win that kick chase? Am I going to – what all those little bits and pieces that, you know, that, that build up to a performance, right, and focusing on the inputs that will drive – the outputs, the KPIs, and, and to your point about the, the full-time professional versus, oh, sorry, professional versus full-time is look the, the guys that have been around for a long time in our experience and have got 150 games under their belt and have been staying at that high level consistently for a long time are the, the examples you look to in a group, and it, it's often challenged when, and the, dogs, when the roster's young. A lot of those guys are out at the moment, right? Mm-hmm. Exactly. There are a lot, yeah. lot of them are injured, right? Yeah. yeah, and it's hard for them to say, "Hey, do this," instead of showing them. Yeah, uh, that's that's a difficult thing too when you actually can't. Even walk. <laughs> the bear, like uh, Sierra's got KPIs, and I, I'm sure he's looking looking at it every week and going, "We're not hitting them. Mm. We're not getting to what we need to get to." Um, and second thing, so obviously, there's a lot of players who haven't been able to play finals footy in the team to gain that experience. You've got a couple that came obviously from the Penrith system, and they're probably some have been in and some have been out. So they're trying to implement that, but it's hard to try and get the younger generation, younger guys, to try and um, stand up. And and I guess that's a tricky or tough situation at the moment for the coach to try and mm. set the standard because uh, the standard's probably not there at the moment. And it's, uh, well, it's like Formula One. You can be only a fraction of a second apart, but that's the difference between first mm. and fifth. And it's like that in professional rugby league. You can only be a little bit off mm. and, and you can have a lot of points put on you on yeah. a given day. And we've seen that with other clubs. It's not just making excuses mm. for, for Canterbury. It's, it's right throughout the league at the moment. You've just got to be on. This is Corey Payne, Roy Asatazi and Dean Halitau Unleashed, brought to you by Reclaim the Game. When we come back, we're going to have a little look at how these guys went at different clubs and their transition period to and from the Bulldogs. An interesting part of the history. We can't wait to face one of our biggest rivals, the Rabbitohs. And we're looking forward to taking on the Bulldogs. Even though we're rivals on the field. Off the field, we've united to take a stand. And say no to sports speeding sponsorships. We want you to be able to enjoy sport. Without betting ads getting in the way. If betting is an issue for you, help is close at hand. Visit GambleAware or call 1-800-858-858.
Doing a little bit, take you away from the match. Reclaim the game and be gambled away. Let's go in the sheds. Welcome back to Bulldogs Unleashed, brought to you by Reclaim the Game. We have Dean Hallitow, Roy Asatazi and Corey Payne, and we've all played at other clubs at very significant phases uh, of those clubs' history. So what I want to start with, though, is Dean and Corey were actually at the Tigers together prior to coming to the Bulldogs. Well, sort of together. I don't know. Did, did you guys consult at all before you came to the Bulldogs around the same time? What happened there? Oh, I, 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 yeah, I think it was a... Flip of the coin, and they said you can have a you can have a contract. I think for Huller, they actually strategically hired him. You know? <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, they hired him for his leadership capability and you know his his results and, and how he performed. But I think it was more coincidence yeah. than by by design. Uh, my my deal with the dogs happened very quickly. I, I met with them on a Wednesday, and it was done by Friday. So it was mm. it was really quick. I didn't have time to really consult with anything <laughs> anyone other than my family and and my manager at the time. So. Um, it was just a, a good coincidence for Corey and I. We actually went to school together as well, as well. So right, we've. Uh, 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 I mean, at the time, I actually like wouldn't have minded staying at the Tigers because I, I thought the team was like performing quite strongly. Actually, yeah, yeah. You know, Twenty ten, they go on very close to, to making mm. the GF, and <clears throat> the the 09 team was a very good team as well. Um, we, we we were very strong, um, in, albeit a, a few injuries, but uh, yeah, with the opportunity to come back to the Dogs, the, the club that I grew up as a as a junior and played in lower grades, I was too good an opportunity for me to, to pass up on. Well, while you came to the Bulldogs, and of course a, a very strong club and, and had been, of course, 2004 champions, et cetera, et cetera. But under Kevy Moore, they only won nine games. Four and against was pretty good, minus 45. So they were competitive, even though they only won the nine games. Um, and that was better than the two teams above them on the ladder. But uh, And 200 better than the two teams below them, not accounting for the Storm were disqualified that year. It's all kind of complicated around that Melbourne Storm DQ period. But anyway... Kevin Moore, and even though there was moderate success there, it, it then went to Jim Dimmick, uh, and that was uh, like a bridging. Jim was uh, Jim was uh, interim coach. He was sort of in the mix uh, before the, that big coup of signing Des Hasler. So under Kevy and then Jimmy, and then on to Des. What was that like for you guys? That was a really a, a period of great change in the club, and there was a lot of fear that you know things would sort of really get bad. What was it like? Yeah, oh, you going huh? <laughs> Yeah, well, Jimmy was actually going to take over in 2012. Mm. Like he, he'd taken on the interim role when when um, Kevin was let go, and he had planned to be the coach in 2012. So the, the back end of 2011 mm. was a bit of a dress rehearsal for him, and we started playing some really good yeah. footy, won a lot of games, and uh, we were you know we were almost making the finals. So it was a a good turnaround for where we were at that year, um, and I think Jimmy, given the opportunity, would have relished it in 2012. Obviously. Signing Des, um, I think I think the deal was made for like a year out, and it wasn't palatable for Manly. No, so Des came earlier than expected. Came yeah. early, so so that's what happened. But it was a an awkward period. Like any any time a coach is let go from from a team, it's it's not great for um, you know just for the general feel amongst the group. Mm. And the way that it transpired uh, when Kevin was let go was was really awkward because yeah. we were in New Zealand and he'd come across New Zealand with us. That's right. And let yeah. us know when we were in, getting ready for the game that he wasn't going to be coaching us that from that point onwards. So yeah. uh, we were we were a little bit stunned, um, and then we had to get ready for a game, which was uh, was a bit of a challenge, wasn't it, Payne? So. Well, I I actually got to the airport and um, Dr. L uh, Joe Lombardo, um, Joe, if you're watching. Um, he actually ruled me out at the airport. He said, you got tonsillitis, so he sent me home. <laughs> <laughs> so I went over and uh, took a bunch of painkillers and I woke up and Kevin had been, uh, you know, relieved of his duty, so to speak. And uh, it, it's funny how it works in the NRL, right, in sport. Mm. It just moves so quickly. Mm. When the momentum's on and, you know, it's very hard to turn back the, the tide. And, you know, Jimmy came in and, I, I, yeah, I think that was a great opportunity for him to, to stamp his mark as a – First grade, you know, um, coach, or be it then, you know, the pendulum swung the different way, and, mm. and you know, the opportunity was to bring in Des, and Des was a bona fide winner, and this club loves, you know, winning, and um, obviously they, they accelerated that transition, and Jimmy went back to assistant coach, but um, it was it was a it was an interesting time, and then it all all sort of happened, and then there was a completely new regime in place um, very quickly, so. Roy, at this time, of course, you, you'd moved to Souths and, and you were, of course, a very important signing for them. We touched on this the last time you were on the show. You were a senior player who they were relying on to be a leader at the club 
and you certainly did fulfil that role. Um, but there were internal squabbles there. Jason Taylor as coach, uh, how did you see your role then in, in trying to keep things stable? Because there, was, there were other ructions too, disagreements between CEO and yeah. all those sorts of things. Yeah, there was a lot. Like um, I think the year before I was leaving, they had Sean McRae. He was, That's uh, right, yeah. So he was a coach I was ch- ch- talking to and Jason Taylor was there. Uh, but then it was like six months later, Jason was taking over the mm. role. And then fast forward that, then obviously at the end of the end of my first year at South, um, uh, Jason was gone. And then mm. you had a new, you had Johnny Lane for the next three years. And then Michael Maguire came in. So um, it was always going to be, and I guess transitioning, you know, I was, I've always been a creature of habit and I've, and the dogs was always where I wanted to be, and because mm. uh, I had a, l- a lot of young guys that we all came through and all debuted at the same time, and we had a pretty successful O four, so I didn't really want to leave. But like it's you know it happens, um, things yeah. happen, and you go across. And one of the biggest, I mean, I met Russell Crowe a couple of times before moving, and I guess a lot of the things he brought to the table in regards to. Um, so was it Rusty or <laughs> Bomber McRae? Oh, Which no. one was it? He promised yeah. you a part in the movie. Well, or? Sean McRae, honestly, I was take, talking to him, and then yeah, like next minute, four months later, I'm talking to Jason Taylor, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, who's coaching next year? Um, but it was, uh, you know, it was just more like what Souths weren't doing too well. I think the year before they mm. you know, got beaten by I think um, the Warriors 66 nil or something, whatever the score. So they they're they struggling and. Like any player that comes to a new club, they're expecting a lot of a lot of things, and uh, they're doing it now. You know, the clubs looking for franchise players to come in and change mm, the mm. Um, uh, the club. So that was my role when I first went there, and uh, we did pretty well in the first year. First time in 19 years we got into the finals. Um, then we got smoked by Manly in the first week, <laughs> and then that was it for the next till Michael McQuay, yeah. McGuire came along. So my role, I guess, was just you know. Take all the characteristics I learned from South and try and take it across. Um, I was always, uh, you know, professional just going in there. And I guess the whole idea for me was just to make sure I was letting guys know. So it was a bit more of a leadership role when I was at Dogs. I had leaders. Leaders. Dogs had a lot of leaders at that time. Mm. So my role was just to listen, um, absorb. Um, but when I went to South, there weren't too many. So, mm. you know, I had to kind of try and set the standard. And the, the thing about when you, Buying franchise players, you also need to make sure that you've got your coaching staff on board too. You need to have a great coaching staff there. Yeah. Okay, cool. We've got this franchise player. He's going to do what he's got to do, but we also need to set the standards in regards to, you know, weights, training, strength, and make sure people are turning mm. up on time, doing their prehab, rehab stuff. Because regardless of whether you, you can have a franchise player come across, but if you don't have the structures in place to make sure that what he's doing is setting the standards, it's never going to be a successful club. That That's a very interesting point you bring up because I think I've mentioned it before that um, there was a period in the AFL where a couple of clubs figured out that, hold on a minute, we're not going to sack the head coach here. We're going to talk to the head coach and work out what staff that coach needs. And uh, in the most notable case, uh, Damien Hardwick at Richmond, they, he was on the verge of getting sacked and then they changed his coaching support staff and they went on to win premierships. Um so there's a lot of pieces to the puddle, mm. puzzle, isn't there? And I wanted to say, you know, how important is that stability? When you when you got a period of change, you, you realise the newspapers are full of stories, whether it's your board or your management or, as you say, coaches and coaching staff and things. How important is it for the senior players to just sort of let everyone know, just, just get on with the job and just do things the way you normally do? And how hard is it to do that? Oh, it's, it's, it can be difficult at times, but um, if, if you've got a really clear understanding of what, you know, what – the, the behaviours and the values that you stand for as a group are uh, and, and you walk and talk that as a leadership, then you should be able to filter that down to the to the playing group and having the right people in the right place that can walk and talk that every day, not just your leadership group as in players but also your staff to your point about bringing in um, good staff to surround a coach and, and, and really bring out that um, set of values or behaviours or, or whatever um, that coach is trying to do, the style of football team that he wants to – um, put out in the field, then if everyone's singing from the same song sheet, mm. y- you're bound to have some sort of success uh, in meeting your KPIs and um, you know ticking all the boxes that you know you stand for. Um, and the results should – it's a process. The results should follow. And I know this is something that Painzo said to me back in the day. It's about building a team of people around you that can do the things that you can't mm. and making sure that they're very good at that and understanding where your shortfalls are and putting those people in place that can do that job. Coaching staff must be interesting because there might be one or two people in that group, and there's a few of them now. 
uh, that that might not gel. How does that work? I mean, you don't have to name names, or, <laughs> but you know that can be problematic, can't it? You would deal with that. No, <laughs> <laughs> the guy with the management yeah, experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 look, my reflection on some of that stuff, right? Like what what Roy say, right? Franchise player. You know, I take from like the Wayne Bennett sort of quote that, you know, get the right people on the bus, right? Then yeah. You get the right people on the bus, you get them in the right seats. Then you get them doing the right things and then you get get them doing the right things right. And that's the culture piece. That's how things are done around here. The things mm. that – the way that the Bulldogs teams in the early 2000s done things and, and they actually – how they trained, how they prepared, how they, you know, played together and then how they obviously, you know, went on and partied together pretty – Pretty relentlessly through King's Cross in the, <laughs> <laughs> the Wallaby Bar, uh, you know, <laughs> in those early today. That that's the culture, how we do things around here. And then mm. you can you can pick players up, so you get the right person and you get them in the right seat. But if they're, if they're only doing some of the right things and not doing them right all the time, then the culture just doesn't you know, mm. gel, and you, you just don't get that momentum. And uh, you know that that just doesn't happen with the team. It has to happen, you know, in the support. Know, function of the, the 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 business, and you can't move too many things at once either. That's the other thing. Like wholesale changes, you yeah. need to be given time to yep. to embed and get traction, and then from traction you can build momentum. And as you know, we see in in games, right? When you get momentum, it's, it's harder, to, you know, to 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 stop than start. You know, it's like that that analogy of the flywheel. You know, if I'm just one hand trying to spin this big wheel, right, mm. it's, it's hard work to get it started, right? But if we're all on there and we're all pulling in the same direction and and moving it, it's harder to stop than start um, and that's the momentum piece that takes time to build it's just a matter of how long that path and how much time gets given and how much rope you know if, effectively you know the, and, and confidence the board you know puts into that person and, and it's a smaller world with uh, more teams than we've had before and there's going to be another one at some stage in the next couple of years and uh, you know it's up to the rugby league uh, generally to develop the junior talent and make sure we've got a lot of players to choose from but right now there are certain positions, of course, you know, you can't just bring in a marquee halfback at the moment, for example, with with, with 10 years' experience. Um, or, um, But in the past, we've had, you know, clubs searching for a coach, for example, that needs a certain level of experience. There might be three or four good but young I, coaches. But I, don't, the, the, yeah, I, don't, I don't think you need a team of champions, right? You don't need the best player in every position to be a champion team, right? That, that's the piece yeah. of the, the, the culture miss, you know, that probably doesn't fully get, you know, the time to, to embed – um, and you know, I was thinking about the Bulldogs over the weekend. I went to the, the reunion. Good to see you. Yeah, and, was, uh, yeah, yeah, Dino there as well. And, yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised you blokes are still on your feet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <I> look, uh, <laughs> well, you are sitting down. Yeah, so uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, sort, I sort of uh, I sort of look at like the, the current team who was there and, and that sort of stuff. Um, and, and one of the big differences from the the you know I, I was. Mm -hmm junior that came through mm. and I was, you know, I looked up to Roy, he was a couple of years in front of me and all that sort of stuff. But through that era, you always had these Canterbury blokes that were mm. always part of the club. Um, you know, during our time, it was the guys like Brad Moran, Adam Brightson. Yeah. You know, mm. they played plenty of games for the – and they really understood what the Bulldogs were about mm. and the culture mm. and they held that to account. They role modelled those behaviours. And I, I just – I'm not sure if we have enough of that at the moment and that yeah. will take time to rebuild as well. So you can go out and try and buy all these players, but then you need to actually maintain, you know, something of, of some substance that reflects the culture that you, you're you looking for and you want to develop into the next generation. Um, I mentioned earlier at the start about Corey's career management, um, three clubs, and actually you didn't really – have a period in those three phases of your career where you were really down, were you? Because all the clubs you played for at that time had pretty successful teams. You're very clever at managing your career, aren't you? What oh, happened there? It's it's not by design. It was by uh, <laughs> yeah. the Steve Fake said, you well, know, maybe what? it was you. you no, know, you're out. You know, so uh, no, I, I think um, yeah, you know, like I, I say to a few of the boys, I, was, I think I said to Harlan this morning. I actually never played in any real shit teams, right? So, <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, Oh, that, <laughs> when I was at the Dogs as a junior, right yeah. in front of me, in front of me, you, you had obviously Roy, yeah. Rennie, Willie, Sonny Bill, Steve Price, Andrew Ryan. You know, like mm. th there was a, just a you know Dennis Scott, Jamie Feeney. You, you, you know, these are great That's players. They all played list. plenty of plenty of first grade and all very well regarded. And I had the opportunity to go to the Dragons. The Dragons team was amazing, right? Mm. You, you go from one to seventeen. Green Shields, um, Nagama, and Best Cooper, Gaznia. Hornby, Barrett, Timmons, mm. Riles, Bailey, Young, Crate, like on the bench, Paul, Sims. And it, like th these all guys that went on and had big careers and then 
the Tigers, you know, likes of Hallatau and Heinington and mm. Robbie and Toddy Payton and Brett Hodgson and Benji, uh, another really good Yeah, good very team. good side, yeah. Come back to the Dogs and, you know, Josh Morris and <laughs> Benny Barber goes on to win a Daily M, um, James Graham, Tolman, Cassiano, um, you know, Greg Eastwood, like well, he was a great player, yeah, yeah. right? Um, David Stagg, right? Like this is Ennis. Like there was a, a bunch of great players here at that time as well, and you know we, we were fortunate to to go on and have some level of success. But uh, I never played on the team, and I was only talking to Steve Turner about it the other day. And, and, and you know, I looked at the teams he played in: Penrith, Pulitzer, mm. Gower, Girdler, Waterhouse, you know, Sat. Like, like that was a great team. Then he played. Obviously, had a he was in the, 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 the <laughs> storm. <laughs> Played with all the great players there, and then he got to play with Corey Payne at the Dogs. You know, yeah. so, you know, I'm sure that was his highlight. You know, but uh, yeah, Zach's career management's been pretty good. He, he was a pretty clever guy as well. So, <laughs> yeah, it, it, I mean, for me, it was more good luck than good design. And uh, yeah, I, I look back and I'm very fortunate that I got to play alongside a lot of those mm. guys. You know, and, and lot, got to play got alongside a lot of good players when I was coming through the grades. Yeah, you know, the, the Benny Harris's, yeah. Jonathan Thurston, Matty Utai, as a Tarzi. Um, well, yeah, there's a lot of great young players there. I think one of the things, Payne, that you, and this is speaking from a guy that's played alongside you a fair bit, one thing that you, you did really well was that you, you walked and talked what we're about as, as groups. And I think that's what got your foot in the door at, at every club you went to is that, oh, this guy understands what it is to be a professional footballer and he's going to mm -hmm. do what we ask of him and he's going to be um, an example of our behaviours or values or whatever it is we stand for. So I think that's why you're able to go to those good squads, mate. <laughs> You've got, to, you've got to say something nice about him now. <laughs> Roy, <laughs> Roy what, what do you do? And I hate to bring this up, but unlike Corey, what, what do you – and I'll ask you too, don't worry, Dino, is, is what do you do? You've touched on it when you mentioned the, the big loss. What do you do? Um, what can you do as a player? You've talked about the one percenters. Is there anything else that you can do when you're sort of trying to get things, get things up a little bit and get that incremental improvement going? I don't know. Yeah, well, just going back on what Corey was talking about then with all the great players that he looked up to and thought came through the grade, I think that's where we are as a club struggling at the moment because we haven't spent enough time in finals footy mm, where mm. players are able to get what it feels to be successful or get as close the opportunity to get as close to a grand final. So because the time, the gap since our last grand final appearance, a lot of players have come through it. Probably never experienced finals footy. It'll be ten years next year since we've been in the grand final. Yeah, so they've spent a lot of time on the on the wrong end of the table. Mm. So to them, it's it's like you kind of almost have to figure out. Okay, that's why obviously Cameron came into the team. Mm. He's brought his team on. Um, they got the mindset. They know where they need to get to. They need, need to know what they need to do and the type of players that they're looking for. Mm. They might not have the players that they probably think they need, and they're probably going trying to look at the moment for the right players. Um, to try and change that over the next till the end of the season, I guess it comes to a lot of you know mindset. Like, just it's, it's just all what you can do on the field. How do you you got to worry about yourself? Figure out how the how you can get the best out of yourself because rugby league is a sh very short career. So you have the every opportunity as a full time player right now. If that's your main job, you have got the opportunity to do the best that you can to be the best player. Get yourself in the forefront so you can help everyone else around the team get better. If everyone else does that individually, you, you get a great side. It, you, you'd go into the gym, dead set, when I was coming through and, you know, Roy would be in there pumping out, you know, the, the squats, 150 kilos, and be like... 250, I think. 250, sorry. No, I'm kidding. But from every age group upwards, right, like yeah. you just had the role model after role model. So, you, you know, you're... Yeah. You, you came in as a as a flag player. You won a premiership under Sticky and under Sticky. Yeah. yeah, and when I came through in that first year, it was I told the story before. I, that first year I came in, I was about to get uh, shafted, mm -hmm. uh, but that just comes. But and then I came back. I saw the what type of standard that the dogs were setting at the time, mm -hmm. and you, I, you just jump on board of that. At the moment, there's nothing for the boys to jump on board on at, mm -hmm. in, in regards yeah. to trying. Yeah, so they're trying to find something, but. So they, it's like they have to create their own little dynasty within themselves to try and, and it's mm. it's, the, it's a harder path, but it's the path that they need to go through because they can't just skip and and expect to get to where they need to get to. It's almost like the movie Moneyball, you know. Yeah, yep, yep. They, yep. they need to find that they don't have. Well, they do have some teams of superstars in here, but it's <laughs> just trying to find the right pieces to get them together to get going. But but you can't go talent first without the hard work. Yep. So you got to and. 
and, and there's a lot of talk in the media often about, you know, oh, they didn't do it for the coach or they didn't do it for this, this, this. whatever happened to doing it for yourself? Uh, personal responsibility, personal pride in your own performance. You that's that's got to be a big thing. <laughs> <laughs> I go back to the point. No one goes out in the field to have a yeah. bad game because they yeah. know that there's such a spotlight on every individual's performance, be it from fans or be it from um, your coach because you're trying to get selected again the following week mm. or from the pressure of having to get another contract for the following year. So that that pressure is always on every individual. And, and there's also the pride in performance. You, mm. I, I feel, there's nothing worse than feeling like you let your teammates down and you didn't have a great game or you mm. made a mistake and um, the mistake led to an issue for your team. So pride in performance is – you'd think is going to be there for everyone every time, but sometimes the anxiety and the pressure of having to perform with all that coming down and you can go the other way and it's hard to overcome. Just before we finish this discussion, and we'll come back and compare these two great grand final sides uh, next, just want to ask um, whether it's this week or the next, the injection of Toby Sexton in the middle of a season. Uh, you guys, I think from memory, just off the top of my head, have had seasons where players have come across uh, halfway through, but... Does that is can that act as a circuit breaker? We don't want to put too much pressure on Toby Sexton at that age, but can it sometimes? I don't know. Just we, uh, I think in 2012 we had Chris Naninu come in. Yeah, that was right. Yeah, uh, that was massive. Uh, maybe Sammy Parrott came in. Both of them. We talked yeah. to Sam about it the other day. So, yeah. um, and, and I mean they're, they're outside backs, winger, center. Um, not not usually. Yeah. The guys are going to have a huge impact on your team, but they did. Um, everyone knows what Sammy Sammy P can do from the backfield. He's such a strong carry. Gave mm. you sets momentum. Kristen was a freak um, ability-wise. He can drop kick a goal from anywhere. He can he kicks the ball really well. Kick the ball really well for for us that year as a goal kicker, and um, he can come up with some amazing tries. So they brought their own skill set that mm. really complemented what we already had in place and the style of football we were playing at the time. I, th- I think for where we were at, we were already building towards being a high-performing team. Mm. They just complemented like it was really some really astute buys by the club he, to pick them up. He knew he'd played in two grand finals yeah. as well. He'd played for two yes. different clubs, yeah. Parra and uh, the, the Warriors, Warriors in, yeah. in back-to-back years. I think in he grand did, yeah, finals, yeah, yeah. and and Parra he'd played in a lot of successful Roosters teams yes. as well. So they they're good guys to have around as well because mm-hmm. they know what winning is about. They know how to prepare. They know how to perform, and they know what it, you know, to deal with the pressure. Oh, in terms of what we should expect of, of a, a, yeah a late season purchase I, i'm you know probably looking longer term and that's that's how yeah. you have to look right okay this is bulldogs unleashed with Corey payne roy asatazi and dean hallatow when we come back we'll compare those two grand final <coughs> teams from 2004 and 2012 let's talk about the dog days Welcome back to Bulldogs Unleashed, brought to you by Reclaim the Game. Now we're going to compare two great grand final teams, and these three guys were in them, Roy Asatazi in 2004, Corey Payne and Dean Halitau in 2012. Although Dean, unfortunately due to injury, didn't actually make that grand final, but you were a big part of that season, mate, so obviously uh, we'd like you to comment on it. But um, before I get on to individual players in those teams, generally speaking, I want to make a, a quick comparison. 2004, second on the ladder, lost five games. Um, you're only second on four and against. Uh, did lose uh, on the way in the finals, on the way to the, way to the grand final. Uh, 2012, minor premiers, only lost three games. But two very different sides. I want to talk firstly about the halves. Now, you played in a guy who was on this show a few weeks back, uh, Shifty Sherwin. He was very much a general, wasn't he, for that team? Uh, with, with great respect to Luke Patton. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> But that's that's what that was Shifty's role, and and listening to him talking about how he got your team around the park, I mean he lost me. He was that much of a thinker about where everything should be at a certain time. I I just I was lost. But that that what was it like playing in that team? Yeah, I, you know, fast forward now to this era right now when it comes to halfbacks, we probably didn't really appreciate Shifty as a player that he was back then because because uh, it's harder in this generation to find a good halfback and. Looking at what Shifty did, like Shifty was Shifty, like you mentioned, he was hard to read. So we just need to make sure make sure that we did. And the game plan wasn't that hard back then. So yeah. <laughs> you know, it wasn't very structured like how the game yeah. is now. So it was just a matter of let's just keep driving up the field wherever he wanted us so he can set himself up for the kick. Um, what type of kicks he was going to put in, we didn't. We didn't know. Only him and Haz were the only ones talking. So <laughs> Haz just knew to be there. You know, if we I spoke, know. Haz if we, loves that. He if we spoke <laughs> a little bit more, I probably would have gotten the highlight reels with his kicks. But um, that was a shifty. It was just the way he played the game. And, uh, you know, 
I look now and I just, you know, you hold him in a higher regards in regards to your halfbacks because, yeah, the game now is a little bit different. So I had to find someone as creative as Shifty was. It's such a great nickname though for him, isn't it? Because he was so <laughs> Shifty. Like, imagine playing against him. Um, it would have been very hard to read. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's how the nickname came about, like just on-field stuff. But anyway, um, let's quickly look at 2012 and a different situation because, again, due to injuries, you had Trent Hodkinson, Chris Keating and um, Josh Reynolds kind of rotating around the scrum base. And I guess it wasn't until that famous State of Origin win mm. that Hodko and, and Josh uh, were sort of recognised as a combination. But they weren't like you, you know, until that point they weren't sort of the elite – Halves were they, but and yet that team still functioned really well. I, I guess the difference, um, which Roy was just describing there about Shifty, was that th- those boys really understood the structure that Des wanted us to play, right? And and they executed that for him, and they worked so hard. They they spent hours in the um, in the theatre with Des going through their own film and 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 looking at how they were executing game day and, and training sessions and whatnot. So that they were really acutely aware of what Des wanted and, and they went out there every training session and every game to try and execute that. Not to say that they didn't um, have the opportunity to, to see things and, and play what was in front of him. I know mm. that's the way Josh often played. Like he's got that tenacity that he wants to mm. play something that's in front of him because that's just his nature. But um, I, I think that's probably a, a bit of a difference between the sets of halves that um, you know, were in 04 compared to 2012. Des mm. was very structured, wasn't he? Yeah, I think definitely like I – yeah, I, I, I didn't – play in those, you know, in NRL for the dogs in those, you know, successful years. But, um, I, I, you know, I always believe that, that that team was a momentum team and, you know, they get out there, they get on top and they dominate and then once they get their foot in the door and they just keep going for the jugular and right. they were a team that could – they had strike all over, you know, Nigel Vagana, you know, he was – I think he scored five tries against South that year. He know, did, he, yes, he, yeah. Yeah, you, you had – Thurston in that mix as well um, has obviously scored 150 tries in 300 games, so he's scored a try every two. Well, they just had try mm. scorers and they had great mm. forwards and they just had the you know the X factor of Sonny Bill in that y- you know that year as well. And you know, Benny Harris, he was a great great player, and um, the general wouldn't let anyone down, right? Like that was a very very good side. But the 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 different the big difference you know in, in any coach that I had was obviously you know. Des was super structured from the way we, you know, we trained, the way we had to think about the game, mm. um, you know, and, and the way we, we actually, you know, even got ourselves fit and conditioned to play. And, uh, yeah, like the, the common story I would tell people was, uh, you know, what was Des like? We had these these exercise bikes at the in the gym. Remember those exercise the bikes? What, the what bikes? No, before that, just the, you know, like the, the electric bike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Little, little dots. Little dots. <laughs> <laughs> and I know, <laughs> when, when I left the dogs in like A3 and then returned in like whatever, many years later, they're still there, you know, and like get on and you, you do 20Ks and 20Ks takes roughly like 40 minutes yeah. there, give or take. And, and Roy will get it in, you know, 39.50. You'll get it in 39.52. Harley will get it in 39.48. And I'll get it in 39.59. So we all make it in 40 minutes. <laughs> yeah. But I actually busted my ass to get it in 39.59. <laughs> Roy just cruised through, you know, <laughs> and, and, and yeah, you guys did your own thing, right? But when Des came in, he he sort of said, "No, no, get rid of all those bikes. Everyone gets benchmark tested at the New South Wales Institute of Sport, VO two max. Going to bring in a heart rate monitor. Going to bring in <laughs> spin bikes, and actually now we're all going to run for the next as well. yeah, put in the chamber, in the altitude <laughs> chamber. But for the next ten minutes, we're going to go to the you know eighty percent of a heart rate max." I'm going to see on the board if you're at your 80% because it's individual to, to yeah. that person. So we all worked as hard as each other as right. opposed to yep. just getting yeah, the, yeah. the 20K. And that, that's how he thought about the game and, and trained people. And, and that, that structure, that discipline, that, yeah. you, know, that in, you know, insist on the highest standards and just right into the, you know. Remember we got, we got sized up on the bikes as well. So they, they had someone come out and size us up like on our, like the length of our oh, legs. Yep, so we sat yep, on the bike yep. and they – made sure we had our seat height right and we had the position of the seat mm. to our specifications so that when we got on, we were most yeah, yeah. efficient. So you could, you could take as many excuses <laughs> out of there, out of the, yeah. <laughs> which I don't know if Cassiano really enjoyed, but, you know. Like. <laughs> that was a sports science era too, eh? wasn't yeah, it? It was yeah, just yeah. coming in. I remember when first, because same thing as at Dogs, there was no structure. Then I went to South and Jason Taylor was he bought in all these structures like get certain trams and all that. I never understood the term. Um, <laughs> because you come from, the, it was just old, so you just yeah. punch it up the middle, you just punch it and just wait for Shifty to do his thing. Um, 
and South was a little bit different. They sports science came in, little heart rate, little uh, trackers. Yes, so yeah. we used to always love to, you know, when the conditioning, same as like you're saying, you'll just you're fake it. You you start putting <laughs> on your, you start acting and you know put on his face like you're struggling. <laughs> And Who was the best yeah, at that? Nigel Wagner was the best. <laughs> <laughs> Nigel was the best. He just, he just needed I, I remember, I remember Glenn Hall. I, I was on the bike once in there, like I was only a young kid, and Glenn Hall came in, and he's putting water all over his face, all over his singlet. Yeah. And he's pretending <laughs> that he's spent that. No, <laughs> well, that's what we did. And Nigel's come out and study the field and study the wind, which way it's going, because depending on what we're doing for conditioning, then he'll just and and we'll go. Okay, cool. We can act our way through conditioning. Then they brought sports science, all these little things where you can start tracking how high you're yeah. going. So the acting <laughs> stopped. So you couldn't put, you couldn't do anything. Else. You had to actually literally put on eighty, make sure you're hitting eighty percent. So that, those days stopped, and that's when I actually had to start to work. So uh, you're already too fit. That's why yeah, you're so right. easy. <laughs> you, well, you, you went through that period too, obviously, where you saw the transition to sports science. Did 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 it suit everybody? I mean, oh, or were there some players who kind of just thought, I don't know if I want to do this? I think even up to the point of me retiring, like sometimes I feel like there's an over reliance on sports science. Is like you got your your conditioners, your old school conditioners that. Yeah, it might not be as much science, but it's still around the same mm. um, basic science around training your energy systems, training your strength systems, all that sort of stuff. But mm. there's also a lot of the old school guys have feel, so they feel where the group's at, where a player's at, and mm. they know when to push them when they can, push them as much as they can so that they maybe get a bit, bit more out of a player from a mental point of view. Whereas mm. sometimes if you lean on the sports science too much and you look at a number and say, all right, they've had enough – I mean, where they know they can get a bit more out of that player and the player knows internally they can get a bit more out of themselves and – you, you maybe miss a few percent there, I, th I think. Um, it's it's certainly great from an um, injury protection point of mm. view and making sure that, you know, we can manage recovery and it's, mm. a it's a necessity in the game. I just think at times you can you can go with a bit of feel on, on guys that have been around for a while. Which is relevant, is it not, when you're in a big game and, and you've got to put an effort in when you think there's virtually nothing left in the tank and that's sometimes the difference, isn't it? Um, just that, that effort, which comes from – Somewhere deep inside, but well, I think <laughs> you that's, can't where, measure. that's where sports science comes in, doesn't it? Like, um, because I know it's players now if they hurt a certain kilometer on the field at training, all right, they come off. Um, <laughs> I'm just like, oh, oh yeah. wow, that's interesting. Um, but I understand why <laughs> you, you understand why they do it, this is because they're yeah. trying to protect them obviously for the game. But then when it comes to game situations where you get caught, mm. you know, when you need effort, you can't, you're not going to go, all right, I've done my case. <laughs> <laughs> get, me, get me off yeah. yeah get me off coach uh that's i guess that's where the pros and cons like yeah, yeah. it's good yeah. and it's bad everything does see I, I think yeah sports science obviously takes a game to the next level yeah. like the professional era mm -hmm. like you know yeah. it's south to you know the, the next iteration of it and <clears throat> you know the, the, the des hasler era the dogs and all that sort of stuff but i equally think you know that the biggest single um you know Important factor is is the mental game, and yep. mm -hmm. I was talking to Hullo about this the other day. I read this thing yeah. about a, a, a Navy SEAL, like you know, he's saying, you know, "Oh, can you give me a hundred and ten percent today, Roy? I need to get out of here. Give me a give me hundred ten, yeah, yeah." <laughs> Bill, one hundred and fifty from you. Hey, like, like, yeah. <laughs> like, you'd you, need you, that from yeah. me. Yeah. But you, you, you go, how do you give more than what you, you've got, right? And the, the, this bloke did this, uh, you know, this study and he's put this Navy SEAL, really competitive guy in, in, a, in a situation where there's a treadmill and every minute it goes up and goes faster, right? So the inclination and the speed picks up and he never put a clock in there and he said, I just want you to run as hard as you can for as long as you can and, and just give me everything you got. So he runs, 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 runs. He runs for 26 minutes. Mm -hmm. There's no clock in the room, but he tells him you run for 26 minutes. He, he, he actually runs for 26 minutes and the bloke says to him, you ran for 28. You, you did mm -hmm. 28 minutes, mate. You, you finished in the top one percentile. The next week he comes in, is, puts a clock in the, the room and he says, I want you to go as hard as you can, right? I want you to break 28 minutes, right? Mm. Bloke runs as hard and same exercise, everything, speed, inclination, keeps going. He actually runs for 28 minutes, 15. Mm. So he gave more than what he actually thought he could give because it's a mental game. And yeah. that was a big part also of the, the Hazlitt era at the dogs. Yeah. He brought in a, a chap. Johnny Novak and, uh, you know, Johnny was yep. – that, that was John his well. John, yep. that, that was what he's about. He was actually yeah. – conditioning our minds, you know, and, and getting us in that frame mm. of mind to transition from who we thought we were to who we needed to be and how we would, you know, take our team to the next level. And I think that mental game and that mental piece is, is equally as important as a sports science. Uh, I want to quickly finish with uh, – well, not necessarily quickly because <laughs> we'll, we'll give it as much time as it needs. Um, 
the players, and we don't want to sort of make it sound like, you know, the guys who aren't mentioned here aren't great players, but some of the memorable players that you played with uh, when you're at the Dogs. We've already had some names mentioned, but um, who did you sort of play alongside and, and have some great moments with that, uh, that you remember really well, mate? Uh, well, when I first got here, I had a really injury-plagued uh, season, my first season here, but I got the opportunity to play alongside uh, Brett Kamali, uh, who was tough as nails. I'd played with him once before in another team, um, mm. but – Noddy was great. Um, the general, I was grateful to play alongside him. He, he was a silky footballer and he could mm. do some amazing things. Uh, and, and Andrew Ryan, like, he was a, a great leader, someone that I you know, became really good mates with and someone that I'd, I trusted a lot. Um, those, those three from the first year probably probably stood out to me. Um, but then you know, I got the opportunity to play back again with Painzo. <laughs> um, One of the greats. James, Gra- <laughs> James Graham, who, you know, J- James is a very interesting guy. Like he's yeah, he sure is. Super intelligent, very thoughtful, um, but a great – Footballer, just tough as nails. Uh, Aiden Tolman, Mick Ennis, who really good athlete, um, good leaders. Uh, all, all three of those guys. Josh Jackson, Dalfin. I could rattle off that 2012. <laughs> so I could rattle off all those guys that you know got the opportunity to play with. But it's interesting um, when you name those teams. You just think, wow, uh, there's there's a lot of integrity there, isn't there? Yep. That's a big thing too. Yeah, Josh Morris, like you mentioned, Josh yep. before. Jo- Josh has done some amazing things at rep level. That um, mm. you know, not that many famous players. state of origin game. Busted. Talk about effort. Yeah, yeah. You know, he, he faked a. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there, there's, there's a but few yeah. just off the top. Yeah. Roy? And I'm – look, it's hard to pinpoint. Um, 04 would probably have to be my best year. You had guys like um, Sonny who debuted that year also, mm. um, Randy Motor, uh, Jonathan Thurston. So we all kind of almost came off the bench – and yeah, there was a balance there, wasn't there? Because yep. you had the brilliant, if only we'd kept JT. That's probably the single biggest <laughs> recruiting error the club's ever made. But um, there was those those guys like Sonny Bill and JT are still very young. Yeah. And uh, and yet you had some seniority there as well. It was yeah. an amazing team. Yeah, yeah. Myself and Ben Harris too was the other. Because we all came mm. through the grades, flag and then flag into reserve grade at the time and then reserve straight. So we had – and then you got into obviously first grade and couldn't go past, you know – Marco Milley, you know, just yeah. what what he resembles as a front row back then and that yep. day, like I said, you don't appreciate how good those players were until you watch the game now and, and you don't really see that type of player. All teams has that sort of old school player. Um, O'Milly for me was like, um, yeah, just just crazy. And Corey, I know you're in the same sort of year as, as Dino, but any anything you can add to the sort of players we mentioned? I think we mentioned Sam Cassiano at one stage. Now, there, there was a Cass. there was a the player that it's it's interesting. Like you oh, look, I could tell you a few good stories about the big <laughs> Cass. <laughs> you, but, you enjoyed the video sessions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> guys like yeah. Sam, and there are a bunch of them. Every club has one or two players um, uh, like like a Sam, who's not your classic. Um, athletic build and cl- just just a different guy, different mm. character, very quiet. I remember interviewing him when he was nineteen for a club presentation night, and he he never said a word. He, he was so he just didn't want you know he was so mm. nervous and shy. Um, he, he he couldn't literally couldn't speak. But um, he, he was an interesting player though, wasn't he? And I suppose you want to be around him when he for those amazing offloads. Yeah, he was a great player, uh, big Cass. I was lucky to be there like when he when he debuted and came on. He was very athletic. He's actually a very fit guy yeah. for a, for a mm. big unit and had great hands. Like you could go to the line and, and play. I actually I sent him a message the other day, just sent him a love heart and <laughs> And he's still overseas, is that yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He did send me one back, but you know, like <laughs> <laughs> he's just, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just delete that one. No, but uh, yeah. Is he still he's still playing? He's still playing, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think Amazing. Warrington, right? Warrington. I, I I think at Echo, you know, Hullo, you know, I, I was I, I like playing footy. Alongside Hala, loved it. You know, he was a great player, and um, obviously we went went to school and played against each other and played alongside each other for a fair bit of time. And he, he was always a guy that you could rely on, mm. and, and that's for me was always an important thing. But I there's the payback that you spoke about. Oh, yeah, there you go, good you one know, all. <laughs> I, I loved playing. Yeah, you know, I had the fortune of playing against uh, against and, and alongside uh, Bobcat. You know, and I don't yeah. think many people would. Yeah, say otherwise, but he was he's one of the great guys of the Bulldogs. He's one of the great guys of rugby league and I you know, I, I really enjoy having a chat with him. Even you know, um today I had a you know, quick chat with him downstairs. He's he's a really lovely guy. He's a he was a great captain and he's a mm. great person. But yeah, like I I was also very lucky to play that year room many times with Aiden Tolman. Um, you know, he's a, he's one of the great guys as well and, and Burpa. Um, you know, yeah. James and I 
re- really sh- hit off a strong relationship. You're going to give, back, give background to Booper. Oh, yeah, one of the yeah, great yeah, nicknames that, of all that, time. That, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, the the amazing. Yeah. But you should you should explain it for anyone who's not aware of it. There might be a few yeah. young supporters. Well, who yeah, I'm not the one who coined it, but I think the, the general gist of it is, you, you know, Booper Healthcare, and you yeah. know, that's the that's it was Aiden, a commercial on at the time. Aiden wasn't Tolman, it? Yeah. really healthy, and yeah. you know, the opposite to really healthy is James Graham. You know, <laughs> <laughs> pasty white and. Uh, <laughs> There was a commercial for Booper, the health insurance company, wasn't there at yeah. the time, where there was sort of the, the sick you and the, the, be the be, be, oh, oh, better oh, version oh, of oh, yourself, oh, which was Aiden Tolman. It was a brilliant, brilliant. How did James uh, cope with that? Was he all right with it? Or? Uh, I think he's yeah, grown up. Um, <laughs> it's stuck with him, I yeah. said. Because yeah. he's, he's named from the UK, like his nickname from the UK is Jamma. Um, and I, I won't go into why that is. Oh, okay. It, it's, it's nothing. Uh, yeah, but I, I just don't. It's not my place to no, yeah, to, to tell that yeah. one. But you know, he's uh, <laughs> he's a great guy, and um, you know, I had a great. We had a great twelve months. We had plenty of fun together, and mm. he was a great player as well for the dogs. Finally, Roy, I'll just uh, let you have the last word. You spent a lot of time not playing for the dogs after you left them. How hard was it to play against guys who you've had that? camaraderie with all those things you've just all talked about um i know you're a professional player and you you were brilliant for south but was it was it difficult at times at least at first yeah it was i guess because you you know these are guys you spend most of your time you debuted you came through the whole system and um and it was a funny thing we, when we did play the dogs i can't remember um willie mason always had a little article you know what willie's like he said <laughs> oh He'll never play finals footy again. So, <laughs> you know, that was his thing. He's gone. Say, Willie wouldn't say anything like that. No, that no, Willie would never say anything that. Um, but otherwise, that's, you know, so that kind of like egged us on just to try and, you know, mm. prove that point. Uh, like Willie, you know, I think the same thing happened in 07 with the grand final. Um, Broncos 06. That's another story anyway. But um, Well, he eventually left anyway. He would, he did. Yeah. But. Yeah, I guess it was always going to be a tough situation, but you, but we're professionals at that time, mm. so you just you knew you had to go out there and do your thing. It wasn't like uh, take it easy or take it light. You just yeah. act a, as a professional, go out, do your job. Um, and best part about it is that you're still friends afterwards, so mm. regardless of where, it's, it's like workspace. Which is a big part of the game. Dean Hallitow, Roy Asatazi, Corey Payne, thank you so much for being on Bulldogs Unleashed. And we'll do it all again next week.